Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning. Lord, we just give you thanks that we can be with you. And Lord, even more importantly, give you thanks because we can be with each other. And Lord, as we listen to your word, I pray, pray, Lord, that it will be your word speaking out of my mouth, by your spirit, into the lives of every single one of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. It's wonderful when we're in that state of flux. Who's ever had major building work done or decoration and you clear a room out, you've got to find space for all your junk. This church has been no different. What makes me laugh is, right, you're looking at stuff, you're going, when's the last time this saw the light of day? Anyway, maybe that's how you might feel about the word of God. Maybe 1 Corinthians has not seen the light of day for you for a long time. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1. Verses 18 to chapter 2, verse 5. I'm going to read it, and we'll take it from there. So have you got that? 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 to chapter 2, verse 5. Do I get an ascension of yes? yes. Excellent. Notice it doesn't begin with J. Now, have anybody else got that? Remember, I had a problem with J. I couldn't find anything with J in the Bible. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of, and sisters, think of what you were when you were called, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lonely things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power." This letter is to a 
church that's in a relatively long, young trade route city made up of a hotchpot of different nationalities and differing cultures. Roman, Greeks, Jews are in there and other religions. It was a fairly Corinth was a fairly wealthless and prestigious city that believed it was the center of wisdom and power. Full stop. Clearly from a worldly perspective. Sounds a little bit like London, doesn't it? We're made up of a hotchpotch of different citizens and nationalities. And our politicians and banks would have us believe we are literally the center of wealth and wisdom. The church was having a problem. It was having a four-way split issue. If you read earlier on in verse one, chapter 1, you'll see that they weren't quite sure which leader they needed to follow. Some were saying, oh, I follow Paul. Some say I follow a Cephas, some say I follow Apostles, Apollos, and some say they follow Christ. Having a bit of a problem, not sure which leader to follow. So Paul's writing into that context, writing to the church in Corinth, saying, it's Christ you're meant to be following and his teaching. Don't follow the men. Don't follow those who you think because, oh, that one's a slightly better leader than that one because I prefer that one. And obviously there was, if you see earlier on, there's a, a clear indication that, oh, you know, Paul baptised me and that was almost prestigious. You know, Paul did it for me. It wasn't Paulus. It was Paul that baptised me. And actually Paul writing here saying, well, I only baptised so-and-so and so-and-so. And obviously halfway through the letter he remembers, oh, I baptised that family, but beyond that I can't remember anybody else. You can see that sort of like, almost like, really, I baptised you, but I'm not going to store you in my forever memory. Don't think I'm going to be praying for you every day, morning, noon and night. I can imagine that sort of reaction. So he's saying, but it's Christ. And maybe because, I don't know, maybe some of the others, maybe Paul was really well trained as a Pharisee and knew his theology really well. But Apollos, we see, is, was really clever as well and knew his stuff, you see, in Acts. Maybe they thought, well, Peter, because on Peter, the church is meant to stand. So let's follow Peter. He's the better one to follow. He's got definitely more charisma. He's louder. And Paul's trying to. No, I'm not going to make the analogy between me and David. I can see a lot of you that was going through your heads. Are you going to make some comparison between you and David? No. I just suddenly, do you know when you suddenly get a wave? You suddenly, I don't know what's going through everybody's mind right now. We are two different people for the right reasons. One of me is enough. One of David's enough. Anyway. Um, so that's what's going on. And it's interesting because he's trying to say, forget the worldly wisdom, forget where you're at. It doesn't make sense. For me, it's almost like the, the great, uh, 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 was it Tony Blair that went education, education, education? Education is going to pull you out of the mire. Knowing the right thing is going to help you progress forward. It's our knowledge that's going to almost save you and the country. I think that was sort of the message, if my memory serves correctly. And that's what the Western world thinks. Get the right education, you'll be fine. The world will look rosy after that. You'll have no problems. Now, I'm not knocking education. Hear me very carefully. Education is good. And when I'm looking at my daughter, who is leaving for high school in September, where have the years gone? I want her to have a good education. I want her to learn well. So the choice of school for us was very important, and we actually prayed about it. That's how important it was. One of the things you looked at was the educational statistics of each school that you went to. And boy, that's a treasury. I tell you, going to each school trying to find out each one. But it was also for me looking at the ethos of the school. Do they believe in looking at the whole person? 
Or do they want to just give them a head full of knowledge and send them on the way? Great grades. We reach the 90% of whatever grades and get going. Or do we believe in looking at the individual child and finding where their strengths are? I would say the idea of looking at the whole person is the whole reason why Christ died on the cross. The whole idea of just giving you a head full of knowledge is our world's way of looking at the person. Don't get me wrong, I want Keris to have the best she can have. I want her to be as intelligent as she is, but that's because that's part of her as a person. But I also want her to be all creative as well and those gifts that she's got. I'm just using her as an example because she's going into high school soon. Really enjoyed the last couple of weeks. We're going to end of school things in the primary school and going to, oh, and welcome to the new school. Seems to be hours I have spent in assemblies and school halls. It's been interesting. Anyway, and we've got one more week. And now the other parents have got their children moving to high school. If you've been through that process, you know what we're going through, yes? Prom. Anyway. Prom nights for prime. <laughs> moving on. For the message, verse 18, of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul is trying to contrast. There's actually two words he's using uh, back in verse 17. I'll read it just quickly. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He's actually uh, contrasting the two words of reasoning there between the reason you can use of human wisdom and reason, which is logos, which is Christ on the cross. Paul's being a little bit rhetoric in his uh, writing here. He's trying to say, this is ridiculous. You think your wisdom, your, your worldly intelligence is the right thing. Because they're going to have people coming in who are preaching, and, and not so much preaching Christ, but talking from a philosophical point of view and sounding incredibly eloquent and intelligent and knowing everything. And he's saying, well, could come and do that, but that's not Christ. If I do that, I'm emptying the cross of its power. Worldly wisdom is not enough. And he's saying the power of the cross to a well-educated Greek philosopher or a law-following Jew just seems utter nonsense. As I said to you, our, world, our Western world idea is education, education is going to make save us. We can figure it out. We don't need anything else. Paul is saying, but that's not true. The way that God deals with things that are wrong, he doesn't hit the restart button, which we're very good at doing. He actually, like, that rule didn't work. Let's change that. Let's go on to the next rule. He doesn't do that. He says, no, 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 I do something else. I send somebody to come and die on a cross. That's what saves you. That's what sorts the world out, not wisdom. He says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Verses 20 to 21. He then asks this question, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Remember I said it's a hotchpot city made up of Greeks and Jews. This is really important. Paul's having to go at two camps in the city. Where is the wise man means where is the Greek? Because the Greeks believe their wisdom. They spend ages just 
discussing wisdom and trying to figure out the world. You know, you can see that in some of the uh, Greek philosophers. You know, that's all they did. You know, is there a primary tree? And things like the long lines of if the tree falls in the forest, if nobody's there to hear it, does it actually make a sound? Who cares? Where is the scholar? That actually is better rendered. Where is the expert in the law? Because he's having a go at the Jews. He's having a go at two camps because... The Greeks, in their philosophy, have become completely blinded to the idea of Christ dying on a cross. And the Jews are so engrossed in their law and the made-up law of the man that they've completely lost the whole plot of why the Messiah was coming in the first place. Their education has literally blinded them to the idea of Christ dying on a cross. The idea of a Messiah, the saviour of the world, dying on the cross just becomes nothing to them because their education has blinded them. They believe that the education, their philosophy or their law abidance will save them. They've not realized that actually all this education, all it's done is blinded them to almost the miraculous that's going on. We live, apparently, according to everybody, a post-modernic world, where if it suits you, you can believe whatever you like. But a lot of us come from a generation where we've come out of what they call a modernity education, which means that there has to be an answer to everything. If one and one doesn't equal two, then it doesn't make sense. And it's telling you that education will teach you everything you need to know. Somebody that comes from that mindset, Christ makes no sense because you can't tangibly find the absolute facts to it. Do you see what I mean? Science hasn't got the complete and utter answer to what happened. So today for us, it's our education that actually can blind us to the power of God. Even blind us to the message that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. That doesn't make sense. And that's some of the battles I think we have uh, with some of people that we go to. People we work with. People here in church. People who haven't committed their life completely to Jesus yet are struggling with this concept. Because there has to be a definite answer. I want proof. Just think about it for a moment. Think about your own life. Speak to anyone today. Office, college, cafe, swimming pool, gym, street, bus, train. Anyone shout one out to me? Ambulance. Supermarket. We keep it at that. We won't say Sainsbury's, Tesco's or Waitrose. Oh. Or Lidl or Netto's or whatever. Anyway. Morrison's, thank you. Co-op, leave, wherever, you turn round to them and say this. There's a man you know has an answer to their life. You say to them, this man had great miraculous power. He opened blind eyes. He cast out demon. He walked on water. He healed and he taught stuff that 2,000 years on is the backbone of Western civilization in its education and actually the backbone of the whole of creation when people, philosophy or proverbs or whatever else, it comes through people, it came via Christ. You say to people, this man did all of this stuff, was able to command whatever he wanted to command, did basically everyday God stuff. Then you say this man died willingly on a cross so that he could save the world. What's people's reaction? What foolishness is that? You're telling me that this man was able to raise the dead, was able to walk on water, was able to cast out demons, yet to save the world, he goes and gets himself deliberately hung on a cross. And you're telling me that true power 
lay in that one moment. Try it this week. That's the reaction you'll get. You'll go, no, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Surely what he taught was more powerful. Surely raising people from the dead was more powerful. Surely walking on water was more powerful. And you say, no, dying on the cross was where the ultimate power lie. Sounds foolish, doesn't it? When you put it in that context, think about it. A load of us will just, just take it naturally. But when you're speaking out there, and even when we're speaking to some people in here this morning, it sounds foolish. It doesn't make sense. Our education wants us to come up with the answers. It's got to make sense. The cross doesn't make sense because its, its equation is death equals life. That does not make sense, does it? And this is what Paul is battling. He's saying, listen, their wisdom in their city makes no sense. And it's invading the church because you're trying to follow different men Stop. Follow Christ. And his death on the cross, which still doesn't make sense to the world, but it makes sense to us because we're being saved. The Jews in Corinth were really attacking the Christians there. saying there's no way that Yahweh would have sent a Messiah to die on a cross. It just makes no sense. Verses 22 to 25. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified as stumbling blocks to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. That actually more means like it's a dead end to the Jews. They just don't get it. It's not just a stumbling block. That phrasing is better rendered. It's a dead end. They don't get Christ crucified. Messiah, crucified. Saviour, crucified. Yahweh sent one, crucified. Makes no sense. The Jews thought they had Yahweh figured out. If you look in the Old Testament, normally when God acts, it's through power and might. He pulls them out of Egypt through mighty acts of power. Normally involves destruction of enemy. So after 400 years of oppression by various groups, they're looking for a messiah saviour who's going to kick out the Romans. They're expecting Yahweh to do exactly as he's done in the past. Exactly the same way. By mighty acts of power that show the power and the strength of God. That is what's going on here. He says, when they demand miraculous signs, that's what the Jews are waiting for. They've not got it. They're saying it's got to happen. We understand Yahweh this way. This is what he does, and we're expecting the same to happen again. When God does something, it's this way. You can see why the cross made no sense to them. That's why they don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Because they're expecting mighty acts of power to save them. And no, I'm not going to make a massive reference to what's going on in the news at the moment. But God doesn't always act the same way. 
But what about yourselves? If you look back over your life and what God's done to you and for you, and you're looking for answers at the moment, maybe tonight at Envisioned, you're looking answers about your future ahead and you're expecting God to almost answer in the same way that he's done in the past. Maybe you're expecting God to say, ah, oh, yeah, quit your job, move on to the next one. That's what I've asked you to do before, do it again. Or maybe you're expecting God because you're really oppressed in your job and you're feeling God's going to say to you, stay, stay, stay. Because that's what I expect you, that's what I've done, made you do in the past. But God actually say, no, I want you to go the other way. God doesn't do it. And please excuse me, if you think that's a word from God to you now from me, come tonight. Don't rely upon what I'm saying up front. But sometimes we expect God to treat and act with us in exactly the same way that he's always done. God doesn't. The spirit blows where it will. He, he's, his love is there. His steadfast faithfulness is always there. But sometimes he has to teach us something new about him and about us. And it doesn't always go the same way as he's done in the past. The Jews were expecting God to come in and woof them out. We'll literally crush the Romans. Free you now. It's done. And some of us might be expecting that. I've got an enemy in my workplace. I haven't. I love David. You've got to be careful, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> Lord, you got rid of the last one. I want you to get rid of this one. And Yahweh's going, I'm not going to. You need to learn something about you. God doesn't always do things the same way. This was the problem. And I've got to say, it does make sometimes it really, really irritating. Let's be up front, shall we? Who finds it really irritating when God doesn't seem to be answering in the way we expect him to? He's God. Get over it. If there was a mirror there, I'd be talking to myself. But sometimes you think, come on, God, please. I swear you can do this the same way. Just drop a check through my front door like you did the last time. Or just let me check my bank balance and miraculously there's the money that I needed. God's going, nope. You need to learn something different about my faithfulness and the way I work and the way I act. My chesed is there. My steadfast faithfulness and love is always there. I have the very best at heart for you as my people and as a person. But it doesn't mean that you think you're going to get the answer in the same way. So you have to become a God thinker. Now, it's impossible for us because we're not omnipresent, omniscient. But we need to understand that our God thinks completely differently from us. He doesn't suffer from worldly wisdom trappings that we do. I can't think of the countless stories of people who have been trying to figure out their lives. I, I'm going to talk maybe about financial here, but trying to want to get some money, really need to sort it out, and, and, and they're thinking worldly in how they're going to get some of that money. And they've been, but they've been praying about it and expecting something to happen. Then left field, God provides out of a source they just did not expect. Or peace. You want a peace in a situation and you thought that peace is actually that God will remove the person from your life. But actually God comes again left field and goes, no, I'm just going to bring you shalom inside of you during the turmoil. We've got to become God thinkers, not world thinkers. God never does stuff from a preconceived box. 
He always, not always, but you know what I'm saying? He, don't expect God to go, oh yeah, that's how God deals with that situation. So I'm, I know what I'm waiting for. Because God's going, no, 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 no. It's like me coming into ministry. I was expecting to be made redundant. Come on, God, this is how you do it. You make it a very clear answer. And he did. You quit your job. No. 19 years. God things, does things differently. And that's the problem. This is the problem in Corinth. This is the problem why the Greeks don't get it with their education. This is why the Jews don't get it with the following uh, the law. Is they don't understand Christ crucified. They don't get the fact that actually Jesus died on a cross, rose again. That's what's going to save you. And there is no educational full answer to it. I've got to just say in verse 25, I like Paul's uh, rhetoric mucking about here. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Like God is a fool and like God is weak. He's saying no matter you might take God in your thinking to the lowest point, it's always going to be higher than you. And for me, there's a point there that actually some of the, the Jews and the Greeks are trying to almost think of God almost in a man sense or a woman sense. Do you know what I mean? They're trying to pull God down to their way of thinking. To understand God or even to try and put him down. We're pulling him down to our way of thinking. And God's going, I'm way, way, way above any of that. I'm, I'm beyond comprehension in that respect. So don't limit what I can do and how I do it. Twenty six to thirty one. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lonely things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Who here believes they are called by God? Who here? Come on. If you believe you're called by God, put your hand up. Come on. You fool. You're a fool. It says here. Paul says it quite clearly. Don't blame me. I'm only following the teaching. Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world. (laughs) To shame the wise. Hang on. Chose the foolish things of the world. All of us. Uh, Does it make you feel better now? Good. I recognise I'm a fool. Joy will probably tell you on quite often occasions I can be a fool. But I'm pleased I'm a fool. Because it's the power of Christ in me, not me. If I was to rely on my three O levels and degree in theology... I'm going to be honest, when I read, I've done this sermon at another church uh, last year, and I felt God say, pull it up for this Sunday. And it actually originally says 311 is an almost a degree, and I scrubbed out the almost. (laughs) But being honest, if I was to rely upon that, I wouldn't get very far. 
I wouldn't be able to stand here and speak. I would not be able to pastorally care for people. I would not be able to basically wake up in the morning and breathe. I'm most certainly not wise by worldly standard. But because of me being a fool, and because, funny enough, of the foolishness of God, he's chosen a fool like me, that I can be called a child of the living God. Not because of anything I have done, but because of him. And that goes to the same of every single one of us in this room. You might have a master's. You might have a PhD. You may have absolutely no qualifications whatsoever. When it comes down to Christ choosing us, none of those things count. It's because he chose, we responded, that's why you can be called a child of the living God. Simple. So proudly say, yes, I'm a fool. Don't shout it too much out in the street. A white van might pull up and... Um... This is what gets me. This is something about the cross. Verse 28. He chose the lonely things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are This gets me. This is the cross. This is the gospel message. Jesus chooses the outcasts. Doesn't just choose the poor and the materially poor, but he chooses all of us who are society outcasts. Chooses those that have no voice in society to become his own. Christ chooses the have-nots so that the haves who think they have all they need will recognise they are the have-nots. Prior to becoming a Christian, I thought I was a have. But as actually I was a have-not. I wasn't particularly influential. Nobody would particularly listen to me. Some of you now this morning have probably nodded off and not listening and thinking about your shopping bill. (laughs) Or thinking about, oh, what am I going to do this afternoon? Oh, bright sunshine. But all of us here were have-nots until we had Christ. All of us here were not influential until we had Christ. Because we're all fools, it's the power of Christ in us that makes us haves and influential. Now, you could be sitting and saying, I'm not influential in my workplace. I'm not influential in my family. I don't have a voice anywhere. Oh, yes, you do. Because the spirit living in you gives you that voice. Every single one of you. Not your education. Not to maybe your position in society, but your position as a child of God gives you the influence and the voice. In the city, the church didn't think they had a voice because they were mainly made up of those who were the outcasts of the city. But Paul is saying, no, 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 you've got the biggest voice going. You're influential. Because God's chosen you to shame those in the city. God has chosen you, GBC, to shame those in your workplace, cafe, supermarkets. We're not going to go through the list again. Swimming pool, bus, train. Not because you know it, but because you know him. And we see this in when he says in verse 31, Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 
Don't boast in what you have, boast only in him. That comes from Jeremiah 9.24, begins with J, yes, and I will find it. Just like that. If you don't get this joke, look at a sermon I did a couple of weeks ago. Jeremiah 9.24 says, uh, 23.24 says, This is what the law says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight declares the Lord. This is the thing that pointed out for me as I read this. But he who bo- let, let him and her who boasts, boasts about this, that he who understands and knows me. Relationship. I'm now being very careful not to impose a New Testament way of thinking into an Old Testament bit of scripture, but I'm going to take that out and place it into this. It's about relationship. It's about knowing who he is. It's about having a relationship with God. That's what you boast in. I could unpack the Bible for you theologically. I could chop and change and quote verses to you. No, I can't. Others could chop and change and quote verses for you from the Bible. And the Bible, trust me, has been so abused and misused out of context. It is scary. But we could do that all day long. Justify our actions by throwing something from the Bible. But if you don't have the relationship with God... You have nothing to boast about. For me, I think Paul pulled this out to talk because Paul was very relational with people and with God. And it's what it's let the person boast that they know the Lord, not know about him, but know him. How do you know him? You give your life to him and you spend time with him. In prayer, reading his word, talking to others about him. But talking to him is more important and listening to him. It's relationship. Do you know a bad relationship? It's when you shut your ears off to the other person. You're not listening to them. This is not a confession about me and Joy. (laughs) Thank you, dear. She just went, huh? (laughs) But actually, you know when the relationship's not good. When you shut your ears off and they're just gabbling at you and after a while you go, I've no idea what they've just said. You're all looking at each other now. She's going, oh my life. But that's the same with God. If you're not listening to him, if you're shutting your ears off to him, you're not sort of sitting there thinking, all right, you know, because sometimes it is a strain, not just to listen to God, but to listen to anybody. There's times you're in a really low place and you just can't be bothered to talk and listen to anyone. You're just not in that point. But actually, that's when, if it goes on for too long, you know that you think, I need to open my ears. I need to let God speak to me. And then I need to listen and I need to act on what he says. But it's a relationship. And he said it really well earlier on. God's interested in the little things of our lives. He's not just interested in the big decisions. He enjoys the relationship and that's what we should boast in. Verses two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, 
but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. I think every single one of us can take encouragement from this verse. Paul, the greater Saint Paul, the apostle, educated by philosophy and law, Pharisee of Pharisees, as he quotes about himself, as Pastor David put a couple of last week, or no, two weeks ago, and he counted all that, need not remind you, but knew everything. Yet, he says, when he came here to Corinth, he didn't come with persuasive words. He did not come with all his education. He came actually fear and trembling. He came in the power of Christ. You've got to think, by the time that Paul was reaching out to Corinth, he had already been beaten up, jailed for his preaching. And in the end, enters a wealthy, powerful, educated, up its own backside city. And he's a man of no great repute. He is just a Pharisee as far as the Greeks are concerned. His, his, edu- his job is a tent maker. That's it. But he comes and preaches Christ crucified. And a church starts. People come to know Jesus. People get baptised. Not necessarily by him, but by others. He said, I didn't come in with persuasive words. I didn't come in in with knowing everything. I came in with fear and trembling. And I just talked about Jesus and him crucified. We live in West London. City made up of corporations, government, wealth. And let's be honest, in West London, a bit of pretension about itself. You and I are a small fish in a very large ocean. You might turn up to someone and say, do you know I'm a Christian? Sometimes that won't mean a lot to the Greeks or the Polish or the Brazilian or the Asian or the African or the European or the English or, 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 or. And normally people don't listen to us when they ask about your job, do they? You always notice that when you meet somebody for the first time around here, the the second question normally is, what do you do for a living? And then when you tell them, and it's not particularly sounds powerful in worldly status, they may not want to really talk to you too much after a while. Try saying you used to be an estate agent. Watch how you're vilified. <laughs> Try saying you used to be a used car salesman. It's even worse. Wait till you say you're a minister of religion. They really don't want to talk to you. And that's just here. <laughs> but you think about it. Our job is our status. You're worth talking to if your job if you have one, is worth talking about. Saying you're a Christian doesn't mean a lot to people. They want to hear, normally, about your job. So some of us don't think we have influence because of our status, but that's worldly wisdom. That's not God's wisdom. Paul walked into a big city, fear and trembling. But preached in the power of Christ, people came to be saved. You might walk into your list of all the places you could possibly go, and you might think, I've got no influence here. Nobody's not going to want to listen to me. If you're using your own power, correct. Use the power of Christ, and they will. Point 
point for this morning is that we really think that we're of no influence anywhere. A lot of us actually walking, diminishing the influence that Christ has given us to impact people around us. When Paul says at the end of that, I did this in great power, I don't think he was just talking about miraculous signs and healings. I think he was just talking the speech that came out of his mouth as he talked about Christ. Some of us sometimes think we need to use miracles to prove that Christ is real. Majority of people actually converted through relationship with fellow Christians, relationship with God, but actually people just telling people about Christ. People don't hear the message anymore. They hear some pseudo version of it that the news might make up. I got, um, uh, got to be careful what I say here. Um, I got, I asked God to help me engage in an area that I was at. And I didn't expect what I got was, was somebody coming at me with all what is wrong about Christianity. But everything they were telling me was, was, was correct on one level. But it was born out of books they read that had nothing to do with the Bible. And that's what people hear. So when you walk in, you may think, I've got no influence here. I am a fool. I haven't got enough up here. You don't. But you've got enough in here. And he's called the Holy Spirit. And he will gift you and empower you to speak to people around you. And if you're sitting there thinking, no, it doesn't work. Yes, it does. Just because their reaction is poor doesn't mean it doesn't work. And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is just somebody you grasp onto whenever you feel like it, because he's a relationship as well, because he's part of the Godhead. But it's the relationship that will influence. Christ doesn't make sense until you come to know him. And you don't have to be loud about it. Sometimes I think some people see preaching as loud or communicating Christian gospel. You've got to be able to be quite boisterous. You don't. Sometimes you can be the quiet person. The one who speaks quietly, one or two words, chatting naturally over a cup of coffee. The same power is at work through you, the foolish person, into the other person. And I know you may not like being called a fool, but actually it's helpful. It keeps us humble. Don't walk around with our brains shut off. Do you know what I mean? But realize it's the power of Christ that saves. Just want to sit for a minute with God. And then I'll close in prayer. Just sit for a minute. Lord, I thank you for education. Because it is needed. It's something you use. It's something you speak through. You didn't say education gets parked. Lord, I know that you want us to read your word. Because the more we know your word, the more you can use us to influence people's lives. But Lord, it's all through the power of the Spirit. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that going out this week, that we recognise that it's okay to be a fool and to rest in your power. Help us to defeat the wisdom of those around us because it's not your wisdom help us to unveil and unlock their eyes through the power of the spirit and for those of us here this morning who have not fully committed our lives to you lord i pray that we get it today it somehow makes sense and that we commit lives to you this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We 
We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.